Awesome. Hello, hello. Happy Saturday, folks. I am so excited to welcome you all to our Wild Edible Banquet Series. Um, my name is Nathan Hunter. I'm with the Bronx River Alliance, and I'm excited today to be joined by Journey Bimwala and Candace Thompson, and they're going to be introducing us to techniques for making easy ales and for making wines out of wild foods uh, found at the Bronx River Foodway. Um, right now, we're, uh, we're recording live from the Bronx River House, which is located in Starlight Park. Um, this is the Bronx River Alliance's headquarters, our, our home base. It's also our district headquarters for New York City Parks. Um, and we're excited today to share this space and to share these recipes um, for you to explore and to maybe put into action this fall. Uh, we are not collecting funds to cover the cost of these workshops, but instead ask you to just consider where you can be donating this, uh, this Indigenous Peoples Day. We today are uplifting our Indigenous Peoples Day NYC group um, that is, has an outpost at Randall's Island uh, as a tradition. Um, you can find them on Instagram at indigenouspeoplesday.nyc. <laughs> and you can also see a, a link which will be dropped in the YouTube channel here. Um, we ask that you, you make a contribution to an indigenous group um, focus on giving back land um, as we are taking from the land today and showing you ways to use the wild foods that are right in your backyard and your city park um, to make a meal for yourself and for your friends. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, our team today. Here's Candace Thompson and Journey Bimwala. Hi. Give us a second to put on our mics. Where's yours, Journey? Oh, Tanya, do you have it? Oh, here it is. May I do the honors for you, my friend? Thank you. Awesome. Are you on this side? <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Candice. I'm Journey. And we're really excited to be here to share with you this um, series of workshops. This is our first one doing together. So yeah. this is our first time learning to tango <laughs> together. So bear with us if we kind of like have some awkward pauses. It's okay, it's okay. I think you guys are going to enjoy today. It's gonna to be fantastic. Um, you can take some notes, um, you can leave some comments, right? So just stay in tune with us. Yeah, so today we wanna to talk about brewing, right? And um, I don't know about you, but when I was first starting to learn how to brew or I first kind of like thought about wanting to learn these things, I had all of these like fears that had been kind of cooked into me about that like this stuff had to be sterile and I might make myself go blind or like write all these things that we hear. And like, if you can wash your hands and make sweet tea, you can do this. It's not actually that hard. Wow, um, wow, wow, wow. Well. You say <laughs> if you can wash your hand, the pandemic already has shown us some of us don't have a little struggle with it, but I'm pretty sure by now there's been plenty of tutorial on how to wash your hands. Yeah. So yeah. we should be good, right? We're good on that, right? <laughs> Uh, we clearly have some like facial steam going on here. We've set up some pots to go. Um, but first we wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about like what fermentation it is. is, right? Yes, yes. So fermentation. Um, fermentation is something that happens all over the world. Before we have refrigeration and all of these things, all cultures all over the world, that is one thing that we all have in common is that you know, we rely on fermentation, not just to extend the life shells of our food, but to also enhance nutritional values of it and to get some really good tasting alcoholic beverage out of it too. And I like to remind <laughs> myself that like, even before we were human, like animals eat fermented fruit, right? Like elephants and raccoons and monkeys. Maybe people remember, like, I remember seeing like an Instagram meme about somebody who like thought that the raccoon in their backyard was like had rabies. In fact, it was just getting super crunk on like fermented apples. Like, so we, we probably co-evolved with this, right? Like we, we came standard knowing how to work with yeast and sugar and thyme in this way. And so I think it's really cool to remember that like this is an ancestral skill. Yes, it's very, very ancestral, which is why 
we have to kind of relearn this thing because we moved far away from it to the point where we're like, mm, fermentation, what is that? I don't know, right? But it's just like, it's down in our DNA, you know? Like Candace said, even before us, there was always fermentation. She mentioned, you know, apples and fruit fermenting. If you've ever walked or even just let something out, like a fruit or anything out, it's gonna go through that process of fermentation. But um, when we speak about fermentation, there is one thing that you absolutely need. You know, we need some kind of yeast, some kind of bacteria. We need another life form to help us to get that thing to ferment. If there is no other life force there, there will be no fermentation. Yeah. And I like to think about it like the other day in our Foodway meeting, Nathan started it off by saying, um, how do you define community care? Right. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking on my way here this morning that like in some ways, like what you're doing is creating a space for a community in this case, like a Saccharomyces, yeah. you know, in bug, right, a germ, um, to, to thrive, right? You're giving it the sugar it needs to eat mm -hmm. and you're making sure that no one else is going to enter that space and kind of take over, right? So you're really kind of creating like a, a little incubation area, right? So it is really kind of a inherently like care based yeah. act you it know? really is a care-based act you can even take it a step further or closer to home think of your pets mm -hmm. right your cherished pets you have to feed them you have to create a nice environment for them right so when we're fermenting because we're using like forms bacteria yeast we're also creating a nice low environment for them we are feeding them we are watching over them we are making sure that they are still alive and kicking and um that's like the same type of concept with the exception that you know whatever those um, microbes are going to create at the end we get to use it right we get to drink it we get to eat it and we get to benefit from it, which I really like because, you know, some of us might be wary and um, of bacteria, right? And for good reason, right? But we also want to always remember that there's a good and there's a bad. And today we're going to learn all of the things that is good about bacteria and how we utilize them literally to create so many different things that we use on our day-to-day -day life like we can't live without these microbes like they are really really um important to us yeah and it's kind of a question of succession really right yeah. like like we're going to show you later how you can make like a wild yeast starter right well if i was to not take care of that if i was to just leave it on my counter and forget it which i have done before <laughs> um it will evolve right another bacteria will come in and be like oh sweet i'm gonna eat these and then another bacteria and it will get skanky fast so there's a certain amount of time that you're looking at when this kind of window of opportunity with this bacteria happens. Yeah. And so just using your common sense, if it stinks, don't eat it. Like these things that like, we just kind of, yeah. we think it's so much harder than that. It's really not, you know? It's really simple. Use your senses, use your sense of smell. Your smell will let you know your body, you know, when you smell something it automatically like, mm, ew, uh, right? That's your body's telling you like, yo, nope, we're not doing that. Just follow <laughs> along with that. You yeah. know, but if you smell it, it's like, mm, I don't know this, it doesn't smell bad, but it has this smell that I kind of like, then, hey, go ahead, taste it, right? So it's like, you guys are going to see that um, you're going to have to use your sense of your sense of smell. So every stage, you can smell it, like see what it smells like. And then you can be like, you know, what? when I first started, this is what it smelled like. But now that the, the, the bacteria, the microbes are alive and doing their thing, the smell has changed. This way, the second time or the third time, you become um, more aware of the smell and you know when it's gone too far, you know when it's too early, and you'll know when it's just right. Yep. And that's just a question of practice. <laughs> yeah. That's just a question of practice. And I think, you know, when you're first getting started with these things, at least I know for me, like I followed recipes, which is really hard for me. I don't follow directions <laughs> well, but I was very like specific and made sure that I used the right amounts of everything and like kept an eye on it. Right now I play fast and loose with it because I can sense, like I can see, okay, it's done fermenting. I know now, or mm, yeah, this seems like it's okay. You know, like you, the more you do things, anything, right? Any skill or craft you pick up, the more you kind of become comfortable with it and it becomes legible to you, the more creative you can be. Absolutely. So just like Candice said, you know, when you first start, just follow along with the direction. Once you follow along with the direction and be like, hey, if you like us, because we like to go off the beaten path, you know, then you can go ahead and do that because you at least, you know the steps and be like, you know what? 
I didn't follow the steps this time and something went off, but at least you'd be like, oh, that's because I skipped a step. Mm -hmm. Right. So do that first, follow direction first, and then you do your own thing. <laughs> yeah. And we wanted to talk a little bit about terminology, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about fermentation, particularly at brewing, right? Um, when we were designing the like flyer for this day, I often refer to what I'm going to show you how to make as beers. Now, technically, prior to the 1500s, they were beers. Anything that was brewed and fermented was a beer or an ale. Those things were yeah. interchangeable. There was this set of laws that the Germans made, the German purity laws, that said that beer would now, from henceforth, involve malt, which would be either bar usually barley, mm -hmm. um, yeast, yeah. water, and hops. That's a beer. So when you go to the store and you're seeing IPAs and Budweiser and Miller High Life, that's why most of those include those ingredients, sometimes rice, sometimes wheat, but like it is a very specific set of plants that are used in that process. And a very specific set of sugars, usually malted barley or other malted starches or grains. Whereas I'm not going to teach you how to make a Budweiser. What I'm <laughs> teaching you how to make is um, a far more ancient kind of brew that you would probably these days technically refer to as an ale. But the line between where it is a wine and an ale is pretty murky. Um, there's also things like mead, right? Which would be this made with honey. So like there's all these terms that kind of get yeah. thrown around that can make you feel intimidated. Um, just make a cool fermented drink. Who cares yes. what it's called, you know? That, yeah, so if you just leave it as, okay, it's a fermented drink or it's something that you're brewing and things like that, and you don't want to get too technical and you're not really sure what is what, then just stick to that. What I like about it, so I will be doing and showing you guys how to make a wine, right? And there's really like a thin line between the two, a blurred line. But see, we forage a lot of these things and we pick those up. And the beauty about that is when you're going and you're actually interacting with nature and you're utilizing what's in nature, it forces you, or actually not forces you, it directs you to go back to the ancient time. It, it directs you to utilize those old ways. So we are actually going past the purity, <laughs> the purity and the change time and looking at naturally, you know, how will we interact with this plant? What will we be able to make with this plant? And just keep it simple. You know, so we are not going to be too technical in terms of the, the, the terms and things like that. But um, we're just saying that so that you're also comfortable in, you know, if you want to start making these things and going into these type of things and not feel like, you know, it has to be this way or that way. It is whatever way you want it to be. That's how our ancestors did it. Yep. Even until these days, you know, tribes that are still making um, these, these fermentation drinks these, in this same exact way until today. And there's so much value to it. And what I'd like to add to what she mentioned about the, the Budweiser and the other one is like, when you're making your own, it's so different. Right, the, the alcoholic content is different, the, the, the nutritional or medicinal value and all of these things, it's so different. You get a whole lot more from what you're making, right, than what you're buying because the end goal of this is not to get you drunk. Like we're not making this for the end goal to me like to be wasted or anything like that. Um, it's just to have something good, natural to drink that we made, that we can enjoy and get some really good benefit along the way with that, even if it's not the intended intention. Yeah, which I think speaks to like, we both talked about like why we got started doing this. Yeah. I know for me, like I started learning how to forage in the city and saw mugwort everywhere, right? And started learning about mugwort and learning that it was one of nine herbs that were traditionally used in brewing and was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna learn how to make beer then, right? <laughs> and so like, I was just trying to figure out how to make use of the abundance that I saw all around me. And then I learned that like, it can help with lucid dreaming. It's a good women's herb. And I was like, sweet. That sounds like the kind of beer I want to drink as opposed to something made out of corn syrup, right? And yeah. so that's what got me going. And then, you know, it's 
it's a gateway, right? Yes. So then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, what else can I put in it aside from mugwort, you know? It's definitely a gateway. So Candice, her thing was like brewing in terms of the loosely beer, right? Me, it was with the wine. Like I'm really much so like me forging was all about the medicinal plant, finding medicinal and edible plant that I can use for health purposes. And then the more you forage, you end up with a whole lot of stuff in your house. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> what am I going to do? So then the next thing was just like, oh, wait, medicinal wine I can make my own wine and then I can use that wine to make tincture with it and then it will, like everything will be made from nature and strictly from the wild like that was where my head was going so I was like yes I'm going to be making wine so I just kind of like delve into it and just start making wine in my house and then it's like when you see once you guys are going to see how easy it is you're going to be like wait that's it <laughs> so I'm spending all of this money and this is the process yes it is really, really simple. And what I love about this is like every season, you can make something that you will never find at the store. You will never be able to find because commercially they make, they only pick certain grains, certain fruits, very specific. They don't give you everything. So you may not even run into a flavor you like, but then in a while, then just doing other things, you might find things that's gonna open up your palate, open up your world. Like she said, a gateway, it truly is a gateway because you see one thing and then you see another and you just spiral more and more and more into nature, so. Yeah, and it becomes a little bit of a document of a place. Yeah. Like um, the beer I wanna make today, right? I'm gonna use, I, I think we both agree that we are the kind of people who maybe hoard things we forage sometimes. <laughs> Um, and I was cleaning through my, my cupboard to try and kind of like make space for all the new stuff. Yes. And I was like, okay, great. I have these turkey tail mushrooms that I have been sitting on. You know what I mean? And I have these, um, Hoshigaki native persimmons that I've been sitting on. Okay. They're going to go in today's brew. And then I was like, oh, wow. Like, okay, cool. I'm going to make like a nice fall time brew. So I was like, I'll use some mountain mint and some cinnamon, you know, like, and so we'll see what we make. I don't know. We'll find out in like five weeks. Yeah, I like that because you literally can just throw everything together. Now, if you cook or your mom out there, you should definitely be able to relate to this. You know, when it's like you don't have a whole lot in the house and <laughs> or you have stuff in the house, but you don't feel like making a whole bunch of things and you just start throwing everything in one pot, kind of like, oh, what? It can taste good. It may not. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> yep. So you can really do this and come up with something that's great or come back with something that may not be so great. But even though, even if it doesn't come out right, there's something else she can do and still be able to make use of it. And that is one of the things that I love because you can't go wrong. Really can't. So let's get started, yeah? Yep. So we're gonna make the, we're gonna do the first part, which is basically making a wart, which is a weird word for a tea. Yeah. Um, or a juice, I guess, in your case, right? <laughs> so we've got two pots of boiling water. Boom, they've boiled. I know mine has, yours has? Yep, mine has too. Give me one second. And I'm gonna start because one of the things I thought that I would use to demo on my side was that, you know, depending on what types of plant material you're using, different things are gonna require different amounts of boiling time. Actually, I should probably have this. Oh, what do I do? Oh, could I know how to use things. Get it. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to start by throwing some of this turkey tail in that I didn't just knock off the table. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a hard, like, I'm just going to throw some in, you know, whatever, man, life is short. I'm also going to throw some of these persimmons in here. I'm going to take the tops off of them because they're hard, right? And so I need them to boil probably for like 30 minutes or something so that they can really kind of soften up and they can add flavor. Um, and then I'm gonna wait. So like, I'm gonna get mine started while you talk about juice so that I can then throw in the other softer ingredients like leafy greens, like the mugwort I'm gonna add. I'm gonna add that right before I'm ready to strain it so that it doesn't get bitter because if it boils for too long, it is not good. So yeah, that's where I'm at my holding pattern right now with these kind of, oh, and I was gonna put some chicory, which is a root. So that's the other thing. So like roots, mushrooms, dried fruits. These bad boys want to go in now and kind of Ooh, get can I ask cooking. you something? Yeah. So I'm pretty sure people go to know what, how much stuff should you put in there? Is it just random? you like, I don't know, girl, I'm making it up. <laughs> I just See? follow my instincts. You know what I mean? Go with your instincts, okay? 
Awesome. So what I'm going to be making, I'm going to be making an elderberry wine. And I'm going to show you guys the first step, right, which is the, from, the first step, which is from scratch. So we have some elderberry that we foraged here. So Beautiful. There's quite a lot here. That is a lot. Right? Yep, we forage here. So everything we are making is things that comes from the land. And when you're making um, one from scratch, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen the commercial in the movie. You kind of step on it. Yeah, well, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> that All is right. not what we're going to do. So I'm going to show you how you start it from scratch. And then I'm also going to show you guys a much quicker way, which is doing it with juice a hundred percent juice bottle that you can just purchase and then just be able to turn this into wine right so i'm going to need to turn these elderberry into liquid into juice so then we can move on to the next step so what i'm going to do first is that i have a little this because you see these elderberries are very 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 small and yeah i don't want to have ooh, do this over here so see what i'm gonna need a little yes. you need that thank you they really uh, oh they're frozen yeah they still well they move around well they're a little bit frozen so we're gonna actually gonna just give it a little bit more time to defrost a little bit before we put it in there set it over top of that yeah can cool or warm up yep i'm gonna set it on top good 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 just like this. See, sometimes you have to improvise, so that's okay. <laughs> and when you have a partner, it helps, all right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we're gonna let it cool off, but when you finish cooling off, the reason why I'm gonna put it here, because it makes life easier when it comes to straining. I don't wanna have to strain all of these little tiny little things out of here. I can just remove the bag and just use the water. So that's why I have this bag here. That's a so. very useful object. If you don't have one of those, you can use like a t-shirt. Yeah. Or like if you have a nut milk bag, same thing, right? Yeah, stockings, clean stockings, brand new stockings. stockings. You know, yeah. you don't have to buy special equipment. It doesn't have to be fancy. This is the thing about this. You don't need a whole lot. You just need minimal stuff to make amazing thing. And one of the things that um, I like about this as well is that you know, this is the fall, right? Holiday season. There's so many different things that are happening. A lot of birthdays, all of this thing, the end of the year. You can make specialty drinks for those special time, for those special moments. You know what I mean? It's like it's homemade. You made it. You put your little energy thing with it. If you're a spiritual person, then put in all the good vibe, all the prayer, under the full moon, under the new moon, by the beat, all of that good <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> You can do that with these plants. So, you know. Yeah. And just to take it back to the like ancestral idea, um, I have a friend who um, is from the Ecuadorian Amazon and he was telling me that when his community makes um, pulque, like that there are specific ones they make that like only the women are allowed to drink during like fertility rite festivals and like it is for them. And everyone has like a very specific way. They use different colors of corn for different ones. Like it is for many cultures, a very ceremonial, very spiritual thing. So you can imbue this with the, whatever amount of like yeah. kitchen witchery you like, you know? I love those ceremonial things because then like on a yearly basis, especially if you're going out there and getting those things, like you're talking about with the women, all I'm picturing is a group of women, we're coming together and we're going in there as a group in nature, collecting what we're gonna need, engaging with each other. That's that whole community care thing, you know? we're talking, we're engaging, we're releasing. And then when it's finally made, we're also making it together. When it's time to now drink it, there's that extra uplifting because it's like, we did this together. And now we're ripping the benefit of it again together. So I really, really like that. Yeah. So I've been smelling mine once again, kind of like doing the instinct of it. I went ahead and Ooh. added my cinnamon. I was, my mushrooms were starting to smell really, really strong. So I pulled a little bit of it out. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead in the interest of time and all of that and start adding in my sugar. So this is the thing, right? In order to make a good life for our yeast, we have to give them sugar. So I have a kitchen scale, which is how I do it. And I've already weighed it. So if I put this on, it's not actually going to read what it is. But the, the rule of thumb for beer is about one pound of sugar per one gallon of water. 
that will yield, depending on what type of sugar you use, usually a brew that's somewhere in like a 5% ABV um, alcohol, right? Now, it does depend on what type of sugar you're using. For this particular brew, um, especially because we're in the fall, it's, it's hoodie weather, um, I thought that I would make something that was a little bit darker, um, obviously also with these kinds of like autumnal flavors. So I'm gonna be doing brown sugar, dark brown sugar. So this is 12 ounces, sploop. And then I'm gonna add some molasses. And I'm gonna do about four, six ounces of molasses. Oh, except for that I have to weigh it. <laughs> we'll just add that as extra credit. Hmm, actually, I'm going to switch bowls. So weigh, get my tear there. I'm going to get myself six ounces of molasses. And this is going to make the beer like really kind of Dark, yeah, there we go. And where'd that, oh, can I see this oh, bad boy? Absolutely. Thank you, we'll have just a hint of elder. Get my molasses in there. So just like when you're making sweet tea, which uh, I have made all my life, you're basically just melting that sugar down inside your wort. Gotta make sure all that sugar dissolves, which as it boils, it will. As you can see, it's already like a dark color, mm -hmm. right? So we've got right now, just to review, we've got a couple dried persimmons, which you can see are starting to kind of like soften up on me. I'm gonna let them sit in there for a while. I've got some chicory root, which is gonna kind of be like Cafe du Monde coffee a little bit, some cinnamon and some turkey tail. And then I'm gonna add some mugwort, which I put in almost all of my beers. Um, just because, again, it's abundant. Um, so I'm going to put, I usually put like a, a half an ounce of mugwort. And this is, you know, this is one of these plants that's really bitter. So that's going to add that kind of bitterness that you're used to in a beer. That's also one of the reasons things like hops are used is that they're adding that kind of, mm, it's not just making it like a, yeah, sweet something, right? You're giving it some um, kind of more. Mm, I think that like this is this is one part of the world that bitter has always been welcome to beer. You mm -hmm. know, beer bitterness. It's welcome. It's loved. If it's not bitter, it's like is it mm. really beer. Mm. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, you can smell it. Yeah, I love. Yeah, it's funny, right? Like when you're a kid and yeah. like your dad like lets you taste your beer and you're, you're like, like, that's awful. That's, I hate that. That's disgusting. Yeah, yeah. Like, ew, how could you drink that? Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, one day you just grow up and change your mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like you're you used to real say, weird. What happened? <laughs> yeah. So mine's kind of at a good point and I'm going to let it chill. Okay. Once it cools down a little bit more, I'm going to add some of this mountain mint, which is like so, right, menthol-y. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to add a little once it's cool. So I actually did that with the one that we're going to um, process later. I made a maple syrup and mugwort wort. And then I added some sumac and some anise hyssop overnight once it had cooled down, because I know from experience that sumac, if you do it hot, will get really tannic mm -hmm. and it'll like dry your tongue out. I actually learned that the hard way, but then once I bottled it and it waited and it aged, it was perfectly fine. But I just you know, you see that do it again. you learn while you're making it and it's good to learn while you're making it because you can come up with your own analysis and understand, oh, OK, it's because of these little nuances. And sometimes when you are told that you can't quite fully understand the nuances, you just know you're not supposed to. But when you're doing it and you're making the mistakes, which is good, you're like, oh, now I get it. And it stays with you better and longer. Yeah. For sure. Helps if you're a person who, when somebody tells you not to do something, you're like, why? And then you just do it anyways. So it makes you learn a lot. Um, are we, do you yes. need help with yes. your berries? Ready. Do you want me to do this over here just yes. so that it doesn't turn yeah. the floor of the lovely Bronx River this. House bright purple? Ooh, a brick of elder. I love right. that. Then, oh, here's my, oh, well, it's got a little bit of mugwort on it, but let me see if I can get it off. Look at that color. Here you go. Oh my goodness. What a amazing abundance of elderberries. Yes. 
I didn't get to get any elderberries this year. No, hey, I have, I still have some more, you know, oh, I can yeah? give you some. Absolutely. They're right. frozen though, but that's fine. Okay, cool. I actually, I mean, to be honest, I still have some hoarded from last year. So <laughs> it's very easy to become a hoarder. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that speaks to the abundance of plants that are out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And All right, you want me to just drop in, it in? Yep, you just Here drop it goes. in. Spew. Yep, that's it. So you just close this in, close the bag. And are we going to let it sit in here and do its thing? I'm going to let it cook for about hmm, 10, 10 minutes. Okay. And then I'm going to let it steep on its own before I add the once that's done and now add the sugar so for this right so you need to use making one gallon of wine so that means that i will need three pounds of fresh elderberries right so three pounds of fresh elderberries and then three pounds of sugar it sounds like a lot of sugar because it is a lot of sugar but the sugar here is serving the purpose of feeding the yeast, right? You want to feed the bacteria. Remember that whole creating an environment um, for these life force to live and thrive. And you got to give them what they like. Sugar is what they like. So sugar is what they're going to get. Now, does it matter what type of sugar? No, I, it doesn't matter. So I'm not going to go ahead and use something expensive just to feed the bacteria. I'm going to use the regular white sugar because it's just not that specific. So, and especially for wines, like yeah. when I make elderflower wine or dandelion wine, white sugar is a really good one to use because it is so neutral of a flavor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, it's like tofu, right? It's just showing up and like taking on whatever's yeah. around it as opposed to something like maple syrup, which is going to taste like maple syrup or mm -hmm. wildflower honey or yes. molasses, right? They are going to come with their own flavor profile. That's going to augment what you're making things mm -hmm. you cannot use. Splenda, mm -hmm. stevia. I don't even know what any of those other uh, things are called. Date sugar. Oh, you can't? You don't think? No, because you're going to need more of, it's not going to be as sweet to give, to feed, to continuously feed mm. the bacteria. But you could just add more maybe. I don't know. It's a good question. I do know people who use just like, just use straight like fruit molasses or make their own fruit molasses and stuff. So I think. See, fruit molasses it's concentrated, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. It's concentrated. So if you're using something that's concentrated, yes, but the end result and the bacteria, because when you're making wine, you want a lot of, you want a lot of activities, mm -hmm. right? Because after making it and you want it to age, there's all of these other steps that comes with it. And if you don't have a lot of bacteria in your wine, it's going to stop sooner then you're going to feel like then you're going to have to you might have to add more yeast you might have to add more sugar again right so it's kind of like a prolonged um steps but if you just keep it simple just keep it simple you can always you know experiment and things like that but keep it simple with a sugar that is basic is just to feed the bacteria and a lot of time believe you me you're not going to end up with this sugar it, the, the bacteria will consume all of it, or if not, a lot of it, okay? Especially like when you have, if you drink dry wine, for example, it's not as sweet, right? The bacteria usually eats all the, the, the sugar and you taste your wine and you're like, oh my God, it's not sweet. Yeah, because they ate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the idea behind it. Yeah. And definitely like, again, when you're starting some of the, it's funny when we both got here, we brought out our books that we had brought to show people. And we both had the same books. Um, one of the person, one of the people who I've learned a lot from is a guy named Pascal Baudar who lives out in LA. Nice dude. Um, and he uses like very unconventional sugars, yes. like aphid honeydew. Mm -hmm. Cool, bro. If you want to go around and harvest aphid excretions and make a beer with it more power to you man i'm gonna use white sugar or filconcillo or yeah. honey or whatever i have accessible it's also why i'm not malting barley that's a whole other step that i don't need to do you know so yeah. like like she said keep it's kiss. very personal kiss. and it's very based on your creativity you know and how and how adventurous you are and how far you want to step out of um 
you know, the, the circle, you can definitely do that and kind of play around with it. But I don't always have all that time. I just mm -mm. want to keep it basic, um, put in the plants, do whatever. Sometimes we just don't even use, um, you can use wild yeast straight from the wild, or you can use bought yeast. You can also buy the yeast, or you can just get it from the wild. So it's like, you have options is what we're getting to. You have definitely options and don't treat this, you know, too rigid. You definitely have room. And on the topic of yeast, while we're waiting for her <laughs> wine to cook. Um, so, you know, let's just review our steps, right? You're going to make a tea or a juice, right? Tea, juice, boom, done, done in process, right? This is one that I started yesterday. Like I said, I started by making a hot tea with maple syrup and mugwort. And then last night, once it had cooled down, I added some sumac and some anise hyssop. I'm now straining it out with my prized possession, um, a coffee filter I stole out of a coffee machine I saw on the street that I use every day. If you find one um, and you want to give me a Christmas present, I'm ready for a second one. Um, I use, I use that to strain out all the rest of the plant material. You don't really want, it's not going to end anything, but like, it just saves me and it minimizes contamination to just go ahead and get all of that stuff out of there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw it in this handy dandy compost bin once it's done. And then we're going to be ready for step two, which is pitching your yeast. Yes. And so like journey said, you can use conventional yeasts that you buy at the store. Like I'm about to use this Safale US05 that I bought from Bitter and Esters in Brooklyn. Um, you wanna keep these refrigerated or you can do a wild yeast like she said. And I actually made one to kind of show you guys how that worked. Um, and I can do two things at once by straining this and telling you. So if you look right here, what I did was I took some hawthorns, some dried hawthorns, and do you see this white stuff that's on the outside of these, um, got me, Tanya? Uh, you can see these white thing, this white stuff that's on the outside of this fruit, that is yeast. You also have seen it on the outside of organic blueberries, right? That like white stuff, that's what you're harvesting to make your bug, right? Um, I used this because I knew it had a good amount of yeast on the outside of it because I could see it. Basically, all I did was make a little sugar water mix of, I think it's like 80% water, 20% sugar. Ah, note. First, I set that water out overnight to dechlorinate. You know when you have a goldfish? You know how when you're going to change its water, you have to let it sit out overnight and dechlorinate because the chlorine will kill the fish. Same thing with the microbes. The chlorine's there to kill microbes. We don't want to do that. So I let it dechlorinate. I added sugar. I put my hawthorn berries in. And then I've been sitting it on my counter all week. Once or twice a day, I come and give it a little shake. I cover my kitchen in syrup that's now sticky all over the floor. <laughs> and then I open it up loosely so that it gets some air so that it can expel gas as the microbes start to live and create carbon dioxide, but bugs and stuff, fruit flies, et cetera, can't get in, right? If I was to keep this completely closed, it would Ooh. build up pressure and eventually explode. Um, so don't do that. Um, so this is, and you can see, right? I just shook it. See how it's all fizzy, right? We got bugs in there. Probably Saccharomyces. It's a lie. It's a lot, right? <laughs> so I could, if I wanted to be very adventurous, I could throw this in my brew and be like, boom, right? And there are certain, you know, I would probably need like a quarter of a half cup of it. I would want it to get a little bit stronger before I did it. Something I'm actually aspiring to start to do more. Honestly, oftentimes I'm making my brews for parties. I want to know that it's going to go okay. I'm also, much like my idol Ursula the Sea Witch, a very busy woman, and I do not have all day. And so um, I often just go with the tried and true Safale, right? So here in a minute, once I finish uh, straining this, I'm going to throw this whole packet of yeast in there. Now, you don't have to use the whole packet. Yeah. I do. Um, I do because it's kind of what I started doing. And habits, habits, you know, when you form a habit, it's kind of hard to get rid of, even if 
you know, good habit. But yeah. <laughs> and like also keeping it alive in the fridge, like you've got to keep it close. Just like, I just don't, <laughs> um, you know, we all have our ways we do things. So I am almost done with this part. You have to honor your ways, you know, you got to just kind of flow with how you naturally kind of do things. Thank you, Sue Max. Thank you, Anna's Hissop. All right. So here we've got our cooled wart. Um, the other reason it has to cool is because if you throw these buggy boys in there while it's boiling hot, they will die. So, you know, um, one of the things some people do is like they're very meticulous. They'll like finish their wart. They'll put it in an ice bath, make sure they get it down to the right temperature. Again, Ursula, I go to sleep. I wake up the next morning. I put the yeast in because I'm using a conventional yeast and because I'm using a lot of it. I don't really, I have yet in two and three years of doing this, I have yet to not have it work. You know what I mean? And so like, it works for me. Why change it? Um, all right. So I have a just question. A simple, yes. Have a question. Journey. Yes. Um, so the, the wild yeast, right? This thing right mm -hmm. here, because I, I was watching you shaking it. I was watching it. I know it's Hawthorne. I'm a bit thirsty. So what would happen if someone was just to like drink it? Fine. In fact, that is a wild soda, which if you don't want to make an alcoholic drink, you can also do. Right. Right. Good setup. I liked that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, usually in the winter, I like to make a wild white pine soda because I'm one of those people. I'm not really a pumpkin spice person, but I am like a Christmas tree smell person. Um, and so I like to make a white pine soda with lemon. I just take white sugar and water and I stick a bunch of pine boughs in it and I stir it up a couple times a day. So just the big version of this. And after two, two and a half days, it's fizzy. Then you want to stick it in the fridge to stop the fermentation. And you usually with a soda, or at least this is what I do, I put it in like a plastic two liter bottle because it will build up pressure and you need to make sure that it does not go boom. So um, yeah, that. Speaking of soda and pine, I love spruce. And if you've ever been to um, any of our events at Concrete Plant Park at the Foodway, you probably have had some of the spruce tips um, syrup that we've had. Mm. So now that you're bringing up the soda, I've never had that. So I just might want to make some spruce, spruce soda. tips soda. This yeah. winter. <laughs> I've actually had it before. Um, in amazing? Norway, they have like a spruce soda that they have at Christmas. Uh, I still have some spruce tips. There you and go. And forage from the springtime. So yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, I'm excited. How about your berries? Oh, well, just to finish the thought about pitching your yeast, this is step two. It's this simple. Put yeast in, put lid on. This is a little airlock. So this is one of the things that you can get that will make your life considerably easier. Um, what this does is it keeps air from going in right? So it keeps bugs, fruit flies, molds, bacteria, et cetera, from entering this space. But as these microbes eat, they're going to fart, to be quite blunt, and they're going to fart carbon dioxide, and it's going to need to go somewhere. And so this tomorrow is going to start bubbling all day. And this will, all of this stuff will fall to the bottom, kind of like you can see here. And you'll know it's finished when it stops bubbling. So this guy is one that I made uh, two weeks to 10 days ago. Same thing, day one, day 12. Um, and so it's done. You can see it is not bubbling here. Maybe in the time that we're here, this will start to bubble and you can see what I mean. Um, but that's it. And now it's like a crock pot. You've set it and you can forget it. And you just are gonna wanna like check in on it, keep an eye on it, make sure it's still kind of doing its thing. Um, the less you can open it and kind of reintroduce stuff, the better. Um, and then once it's ready, you'll be ready to bottle it, which is the last step, which we're not ready to talk about yet. How's it going with your boot juice? Well, it's going well. I figure, remember I talked about thirst. Here's some water. Oh, thank you. Okay, all this steam is going to make us dry. Oh, I love water. Mm-hmm. So good. Okay, cool. So my little whiny whiny 
elderberry here. I'm going to turn it on. Okay. And it's really, really hot. So I'm going to just let it steep. But what can do, I'm going to add in some sugar. So need uh, three pounds of sugar added into here. This is four pounds, this bag right here is four pounds of sugar. Now, I, <laughs> I don't always measure things, okay? Oh. <laughs> oh, do you need a bowl and a scale? Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was about skull, to say, skill. I don't always measure things. So I was going to do it by eye, but we good. <laughs> uh, let's see. No, not out of your way. Let me get this over here. Okay. Tear. Oh, God, it smells so good. Right? Oh. Now, what I like about elderberry um, wine is that if you know the benefit of elderberry, how well, how good it is, for the immune system is an amazing antiviral, is great at shortening um, the length of time that you're sick, right? It's also really good at helping you um, stay healthy during the cold and flu season. It's a great preventative for cold and flu. So you can use it even before you start to get sick. So for me, when I make a wine with elderberry, I'm thinking like, well, you know what? If I do get sick, I could pull out my wine <laughs> and I could sip on it and still get the benefit of the elderberry. So I love it. Now, there is a downside to the elderberry wine. Nothing really big. The only downside is that this is a type of wine where you really have to allow it to age okay is one of those wine it tastes better with age if you were to drink it within like eight months six months you're gonna be like ew this is nasty like i can't drink this but if you just let it age over time minimum let it age for two years right minimum they say one year but i'm saying two years let it age for two years and then have at it then. But if you can let it age even longer than that, it's even better. If you are into making your own medicine and your own everything, you can actually make a tincture with your wine, right? The same way, so when you make a tincture, for those of you who don't know, you use alcohol and an herb and you put them together in a jar and you let it steep and you let it stay there for eight weeks, or more, but you can do that with wine as well. And because it's wine, because it has live bacteria, which only amplify the healing benefit of the plants inside of it, for me, it's just like a really great medicine, really, really, really great medicine. So I'm gonna go ahead. So this is 29, we need three. Okay, maybe just a little bit more. Oh, all right. Cool. So I'm gonna throw this in here. Okay. I'm just going to do its own thing. Do you see if I were to remove this, then it's really easy, right? And I still have the juice inside of it, get rid of this and good to go. So this is it for this. So we're just gonna let this set aside and do its thing. And it's gonna take a minute because it needs to cool off completely before we can even add the yeast in there. If I was to add it now, it's going to die. So do you wanna show maybe now with the grape juice? Yes. Maybe we can have um, our lovely guests uh, yep. do the yeast and the grape juice process. And then we'll be ready to talk about the last step, which is bottling. Absolutely. So this is the first step if you're making wine from scratch, right? This is with the first step. If you're now making wine from scratch and you are making it from juice, which is what I'm going to show you guys, this, your wine will be ready in 30 days. This is a 30 day wine. So on the 30th day or 31st, give or take, you, you know, 
you're going to smell you're like oh my god it's wine like that's the most amazing thing is when you first make it you be like yeah this is going to turn into wine it's like yes and then you open it and you smell it it's just amazing now i want to say that if you don't have um yeast like wine yeast you can also use just to mess around and start you can also use um baking yeast bread yeast you can use bread yeast to make your wine uh, the only thing with bread yeast is that it is going to give a little bit of a bread yeast flavor, but you wouldn't know that, right? Because you've never made your own wine before. So it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be like, oh, I can taste it. I don't think you will be able to recognize it. But once you use an actual wine yeast and then you go back to your other one, you'd be like, oh, yep, I taste the difference. So if you don't have one, you can use bread yeast. It's really not that big of a deal. It is just for you. So let me just show you what that looks like. Wine yeast. Oh, you can you can order it. You can order it online. Um, you can go to to uh, brewer shops. You know, like where they sell wine and all things brewing. They will always have yeast there. Um, and any any shop online, you just put you go online and you tap in wine yeast you're gonna get a whole bunch of things. Now, when it comes to yeast, also understand like with wine, there are many different types, right? So if you go commercial, it's like you can pick champagne, right? If you wanna make champagne, there's champagne yeast. Um, there is yeast specifically for a sweeter rosé type of wine. Whatever specific type of wine you want, you can kind of pick a specific yeast to do that with and the ones that we are using is Lavalin EC-118. This is very basic, you know? So I use this and like Candice has mentioned before, you don't have to use the whole thing. You can just use half or a little bit of it, but I also use the whole pack because mentally it just makes me feel like, yes, everything is good. If I use a little bit, then in the back of my head is like, ah, Add more, so I might as well just use the whole thing. There's safety in numbers. Yes, safety in numbers. Now, terminology. One, we have different types of terminology, okay? What I just did right now when I added the sugar into here, I have turned this into what we call um, a must, okay? I've turned it into a must, right? So this is, I can't drink this. Like you guys saw the amount of sugar that was added into here. This is not for consumption at this point. This is a must, right? So when you add a bunch of sugar, you have a must. Now we, you're going to take the must into wine. The moment you add the yeast, then it becomes a wine. So I'm going to walk you guys through that and I'm going to show you guys through here. So those of you who are here with us, get your Get your bottle. Um, you're also gonna need a cup and some sugar, right? So you're gonna need a cup, some sugar. Now, when you're buying your juice, right? Make sure it has to be 100% juice. It can be 96, it can be 99, it can be 15. It has to be 100% juice, all right? Because if it has other additive and other things in there, the yeast are not gonna be able to survive. That's not an environment that is conducive um, for them to thrive. So it has to be 100%. You can pick any kind of flavor you like. So you can really create different types of wine, okay? So make sure it's, yeah, smell it. Mm. Concord grapes. And let me just say this, like here in New York, Jersey, up in the Northeast right now, we have a lot of wild Concord grape growing anyway. So if you're foraging and you see them out there, some great one. So what we want to do, we want to first em empty maybe like a whole cup, maybe two cups of juice into here, into a cup. The reason why we're doing this is because we're going to add sugar into here. And when you add sugar, right, the, the liquid is going to rise and you want to make sure that you have enough space for that to happen. So I'm just going to empty just a little bit more because I want to make sure 
that I have space. Okay, this is good enough. And again, she's eyeballing it. Yes. Right? The world's not going to end. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, not because of this. So what you want to do next, we're going to turn our juice, grape juice, into a must. Okay, we're going to add sugar. Okay, we're going to add two cups of sugar inside here. Two cups of sugar, and I just use my cup. Hmm. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. one sec. You just need no, no, she just needs need another cup. cup. Yeah, I need a cup. Here we go. Here you go. Thank you. All right. If it's clumpy, it's okay. It's all gonna come out in the wash. Exactly. Oh, would you like a um? You had a funnel. I do. Thank you. There you go, my friend. There you go. Need a spoon? I got one of those too. There you go. Boom, 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 boom. I love doing this, right? Because sometimes I just don't have the time to do things from scratch. So I'll just get the juice immediately. And then you're gonna see how fast it's stuck. This is. There we go. Up here. Not you. Here. Uh, I, can, <laughs> I can work on that. Pump some sugar, but it's okay. Remember the time that I had you come and make oxymels and all the honey was frozen yes. solid? That was fun. Oh right? my God. <laughs> Sweeteners, they're yeah. sticky. <laughs> very, very sticky. They're sticky because they want to keep you around, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you want some back of the spoon action. Here, I got you. There we go. Are these exactly a cup? Um, mm. Do we know? Nope, no idea. Okay, what do you think? Nah, I don't think so. You want to do more? Okay, boss. Look at how nice and smooth that is. I yeah. need that for you. So you're going to have to do at least three cups of these, okay? There you go. Now we're talking. Okay, awesome. Now, I'm going to add a little bit. This is why we take some juice out because you want to make sure that as the juice is rising, right? Actually, right now, the must is rising is not all the way to the top. So I can add back some of the juice. Just a little bit, not too much. I'm going to add it up to right here. Yeah, that's not. Uh, there you go. Okay, so now what you want to do, you want to close this thing up and then you want to shake it. You want to shake it and you're going to shake it until there is no more crystals. Yeah. All of the sugar is melted. So if you didn't exercise this morning, like, you know, <laughs> so this is a really good time. You can just kind of like. <laughs> buys and tries, buys and tries. Yeah. Yes. And this is a must, okay? This is no longer just juice. This is a must. You cannot drink must. I mean, you could, but you'd, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, unless you want to feed the bacteria in your gut and allow them to ferment in there. <laughs> then by all means. <laughs> okay. Shake, 
Shaken. Yeah, that's shaking. right. Shaking. Yeah, it's shaking. <laughs> <laughs> shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it like a ball. <laughs> I feel jealous that I don't have one. I should. Oh, no, it's okay. I'll make one. I'm gonna make one. Just not right now. Sorry, sorry. I was busy staging bottles. You know. <laughs> Okay, I think I know. So you want to check in the bottom because the sugar, if it's going to settle, if it's not fully done, you're going to see it settling in the bottom. And we want to make sure that it is ready before we pitch it. We bring in, yeah. It's getting there. Yeah. I think I'm good. I don't see. Yeah, it's good to me. Yep, it's good. Mine is good. Awesome. It's fizzy. Mm -hmm. Very, very fizzy. Now you see the fizz that you guys are seeing right now. This is a type of action that you're going to be looking for when once the, the yeast goes in, right? You're going to want to see some kind of fizziness. But if it's a lot like this, then it's like, whoa, you got a lot of action happening. If as long as there's some bubbles, you always want to look for some bubbles. The moment that you no longer see bubbles and it's just nothing, that's when you know your fermentation has stopped. It's done. It's over. The bacteria, they ate, their life cycle came and gone, right? That's, that's life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to, so there's two ways. So you guys saw how Candice did hers, right? She just put the yeast inside. Um, what I tend to do with the yeast, where's my yeast? Oh, oh, right okay. here. So what I tend to do with the yeast, I tend to use like warm water. Do you want me to cut it? Warm water. <laughs> There's probably some still left in the um, uh, kettle. Distilled water. Huh? Distilled water. It's not distilled? Oh, uh, well. Yeah, probably. Oh, yeah. Right. Again, because so, if it hadn't um, if it hadn't been dechlorinated, you yeah. would kill your yeast. The only the other way you can do that, though, is if you boil it for long enough, you'll mm -hmm. also boil the chlorine off. Yeah. Um, yep, yeah. definitely. So if you're not if you're not boiling the chlorine off, then just get a distilled water, warm it up a little bit. You don't need it to be hot. But so what I'm going to do, I want to wake them up, right? Because they're kind of in the suspended animation type of situation. And sometimes you can get yeast, and then the, if the bacteria are dead or not, they're not thriving and they're not alive, and there's no action. Sometimes there's just no action there whatsoever. But this way, I want to wake them up a little bit, give them a little bit of sugar, just a little bit for them to start to eat so that they don't get a shock into their system. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of like you would do if you're making bread, right? Exactly. You take your dry yeast from the fridge, you make yeah. your like little Mix thing. a little bit yeah. up and you let it fizz up. Um, yeah, we're just going to add some warm water, cover it, set it to the side until it, the yeast wake up, right? Yeah, the whole packet. The in whole packet. Yep. Yeah. Now, yeah, you just use the whole packet because I have half a packet, a little bit of packets. You know, you guys can actually kind of experiment with that if you want, but I find it easy. One pack, use it. If as if you start doing this and putting it in the fridge, then it's like so yeah, much. It's getting exposed to air. How <laughs> yeah. long is it? Is it still alive? I don't know. Then why am I gonna, you know, because let's be clear, like sugar and stuff is not you know, it's not, doesn't cost nothing. Right. And yeah. you don't want to also, it's a pretty precious resource. Like sugar is a pretty problematic resource in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And so like, we want to make sure that we're not wasting it. Absolutely. Cool. It's warm and not hot, right? Do you want to do the bottle, like baby bottle test? <laughs> no, I see steam. <laughs> I was like, maybe I ask yeah. That was the I see steam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's fine. I love if having a second steam, burn. Too hot. <laughs> Too hot. <laughs> yeah. I think
think that's the other thing about doing these kinds of things where you're like, you're used to doing it in your kitchen with your flow. And then all of a sudden you're like, right now I'm doing it in a space I've never been in before. Feels warm. Yeah, test it, put it in a bottle, in a cup, and then you do the finger testing. (laughs) But will my skin yeast? Like my body's. You know, It'll be fine. Impact. There's there's way more of them than there are of your skin yeast. Oh, oh. Nice oh I love that. Okay. Yeah, I, I love like, that for oh, you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So not gonna put a lot, right? It's literally just to wakey wakey wait. Let me just make sure. I'm sorry, Nathan. No, you can Yeah, just add a little bit more. <laughs> a little no, 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 a little bit more of the cold water, uh, cold water. water yeah. Everyone, see, it's all relative, mm-hmm. so you gotta. Yeah, that's good. And technically, I mean, if you want like a number, right? It's like sixty-five to seventy-five degrees you yeah, want it to be, right? Um, which I actually, on some of mine, I I have these like thermometers that I used to use when I was trying to be that exacting. Um, okay. So you know, you can look for it to be like that. All right. So you just it doesn't have to be a lot, you know. You just add. Right, you guys see the bubbles that's happening? Bubbles are always a good sign. So I'm gonna add just a very, like just a little bit of sugar so that you have an idea. So when I say a little bit, it's literally, yeah. Like a pinch, nothing really, see, very small amount. See, I didn't even use the whole thing, just very little. So they can, it's like, you know, when you wake up, you're hungry, you're starving. So in my mind, the way I'm looking at this, because these are alive, um, they're alive. I'm like, okay, you know, when you wake up, you get hungry, you're starving. And it's usually not a good idea to kind of just like quarf yourself with a whole bunch of things. So just putting a little bit, get them going. I'm going to stir it a little. Oh, uh, mm-hmm. This is a very big spoon for that cup, but you can use the bottom <laughs> side of it, maybe. It's like that. Just use the back, yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna stir it up. Stir it up. Okay, good. You can eat a little bit. And then I like the way it smells, though. <laughs> like it's smell. an interesting smell, right? I like the smell of yeast. I'm sorry. You get used to it. I think it's one of those things that like grows on you, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I'll take it. Thank you. Yeah, and then you just, you know, just cover it up. Um, nothing fancy. Yeah. You just cover it up. And the reason why you're covering it up because everything goes in the dark. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so we're going to let this do its thing. And when in about five minutes, we'll check it in and then we'll go ahead and pitch the wine. Right, pitch the must. Sorry. Boom. Back to you. Before, before yes. Can you add too much water to this yeast? Like, I know you said a little water. No, you'll be fine. Now. Yeah, you'll be fine. No, you're fine. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. You can tell me the truth. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Like, when you're making your um, juice, you know, your juice and your water, like, so you use three pounds of elderberries. You measured that out. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, for about a gallon, maybe, yeah. that you're making. So do you have kind of like hard rules for yourself about like what your juice to water or your fruit weightage to water ratio is? Well, like when it comes to, with the, with the yeast, it really doesn't matter because you're just using the water to wake it, to wake it up. So even if you filled it up, right, and you put it in, it's not going to take away from what's already in there. Like an extra cup, it's not going to set anything off. So okay. I'm going to be fine. Yeah. All right. Sweet. I'm not like particular about precision because the end results have always been great. So cool. Yeah. So step one, remember, make a must, make a wart. Step two, pitch it with yeast, mm-hmm. give it um, the ability to breathe. Now, if you don't, have one of these or the the ability to expire, I guess. Um, If you don't have one of these, you can um, do kind of like I've been doing for this guy, right? Where you've got like a loose lid and you have to burp it several times a day, but you have to So this is what it will look like. So if you have a bottle, right? You see this top, 
you put it on, right? See how you can just lift it, but you just turn it just one time. Don't do a whole lift. Just put it in, turn it. Well, right? I don't know yeah. if, you, if you guys can hear it. Like if I was to see, do you guys see that? Moving, right? So this way, while the, the yeast are burping and farting, releasing gas, this is what's gonna be happening. It's gonna be able to escape. But if it's tight, it can escape. So that's why it's gonna keep you know, growing, growing, and then you're gonna get a real explosion. Like it's no joke, the explosions are real. It does happen and it's gonna sound like a bomb went off in your house and you don't want that to happen. So if you don't have um, something like this, just make sure you keep it really loose and check it, do this to make sure that you can see it moving. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, you can absolutely do it that way. It does risk some amount more contamination. It requires more babysitting. Um, but hey, plenty of people have done it for a very long time. Again, much like you can get the yeast for the beer and the wine at your local brew shop here in New York, we have bitter and esters. You can also get these airlocks. Um, they also sell these kinds of jugs like this. And then you just drill a hole in the top that you put this airlock in. You can also, and you'll see when we do lacto fermentation next week, use that same idea to make airlocks for your krauts and your kimchi mm -hmm. and all of your lacto fermented stuff as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I like to say with, with the yeast is that they, right. They burp out the gas, they fart, right. And then they will piss out the alcohol. <laughs> That's an easy way to remember it. Okay? As they're eating, they eat yum, 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 yum. They burp it. Uh, uh, and then that's what's causing the gas and then they're pissing out the alcohol and that's what we're going to be left with that's what we want just to show us how much we love to use thing secretion mm -hmm. <laughs> no shame no shame in that all right so you've done step one you've done step two now it's time to bottle it so much like she just said right in the situation with beer right when we think about beer we think about it being fizzy we're used to carbonation in that situation, right? You can see this guy no longer very carbonated. Why? Because the yeasts that are in there have eaten all the sugar. If I want this to be carbonated, I then have to add a little more sugar to wake my yeast back up again, get them eating again, just a little bit, so that as they make that carbon dioxide, it's under pressure and it infuses the drink with carbon dioxide. Now this is going to, I wanna set your expectations. It's going to have a different carbonation than what we're used to these days because a lot of the carb, most, most probably all of the carbonation that we drink when we drink a soda or a beer, that is like artificially introduced. I don't even know how, it's like a machine, I don't know. Um, this is a natural form of that. So like our first versions of carbonation were far more subtle. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because like now when I taste like a LaCroix, I'll be like knives, knives on tongue, you know, <laughs> like it's very intense. You know what I mean? And like, we're so used to that now that we forget that like when you taste a champagne, yes. right. And that like very fine bubbles, that's what this used to be. Right. Yeah. So here are my bottles. I'm going to be using these swing top bottles. And um, the, this is one of those moments where we talk about the kind of health and safety of it. If you have successfully pitched a wort or a must and your yeast have done their thing, it doesn't smell weird. It's not growing anything weird, green or black or anything like that. You're ready for the next step. You're gonna clean these real good with hot soap and water. You're gonna clean your hands before you do it. These things are not hard. Um, and then what I like to do as kind of like my last step, um, some people use bleach, I do not. I use wormwood tea. So I've made some wormwood tea here um, and you do the same thing, right? Yeah. So this is just some wormwood and some water, tea, boom. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a little bit of this. I'm just gonna boop it in each one of these. Boop, it's a technical term. Um, And what I like about this is, first of all, like it's not bleach. <laughs> um, so if any of this is left in the bottle, you know, cause they, I'm gonna use this to kind of like sanitize them, not sterilize them, I'm not pasteurizing them. Um, if you have a dishwasher, 
congratulations, you're more of an adult than I am. And you can definitely dishwash your bottles and they'll be nice and clean, but do check them. Cause if they've got a bunch of soap in them, it will change the flavor. Right. So I like to kind of just really make sure they're really good and clean. Yeah. So you can boil them just like you would, um, canning jars. You don't have to, it is not required. It's hey, gold star extra credit if that's what you want to do. So I've got a little bit of this wormwood tea in here. And I also steeped all of my pop tops for my Grolsch bottles. Okay, and this is where Candace has to remember how to do this. Uh, off the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gotta love when you have to do this all of a sudden in front of people. <laughs> um, hey, right. There you so go. you put it on. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. <laughs> I'm just making sure that that wormwood tea is kind of getting all in the inside, right? And I'm just gonna do this. And then what I usually do at home is I'll like kind of try and make a little bit of a sterile field and very perilously have them stand upright. So, let me just do one, the full step, so that people aren't standing here painfully watching me do all six of them at the same time. All right, so you've got a clean bottle, right? You've passed it with either bleach that you've then thoroughly cleaned out so that you don't have bleach flavored beer, not a fan, or you've used a little bit of this wormwood tea. And if there's, you know, a drip or two in there, your life is not gonna end. It might make it slightly bitter, but like very, very nominally. If you can taste that, you have a far more refined palate than I do. So now I'm gonna prime the bottle. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add a little bit more sugar in. I typically do about a half teaspoon. So I've got my white sugar here. Again, you can use any sugar you want. I use white. And I'm actually, I usually do just a smidge, a smidge more, because a lot of it gets lost down in my funnel here. And then I'm gonna take my beer, here she is. And this is one that I made a couple of weeks ago with white sugar that has red clover, linden, mugwort, and pineapple weed in it. So it's gonna be like pretty summery. Mm -hmm. mm, it smells nice. Ooh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is the part where candy, this is the thing I stressed about all night long was whether I was gonna spill this all over myself. You got this, Candace. Live on YouTube. <laughs> Can you see the side to tell me when I'm too yeah. full? Go ahead. And I usually take it right to the neck right there. You're not in the neck. I'm not there? No. Right here. Ah, okay. Cool. Usually do this over my sink. All right, stop. Stop. All right. Are we a little over full? Mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Well, we don't want to fill it all the way. So I typically take mine. Can I see? Yes. I typically take mine to the top of this neck right here. Why? Because, well, you've just added sugar, right, to your yeast. And now they're going to make pressure. So you need some room in there for all those farts to fit. Congratulations, you just made a beer. Um, now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put this somewhere dark and cool, and you're gonna wait probably about four or five weeks for that yeast to finish eating the sugar that you just put in and to build up pressure and make the carbon dioxide that when you pop this is gonna go and you're gonna feel really cool. Um, some provisos, if you put too much sugar in, if it hasn't finished fermenting, this mm. is particularly true with meads, it will build, if you fill it too full, it will build up pressure and you will have a bomb. I've had that happen to me once, um, which is why one of the things I typically do is I take all my precious little beer babies and I put them in a cardboard box in a room in my house that's closed so that, you know, good Lord, <laughs> good Lord forbid, if it explodes, I'm not gonna have <laughs> glass shrapnel all over my house. I'm not gonna have beer all over my house. It will be relatively contained. I've only had it happen once with mead, which is one that it's very prone to happen with if you don't let it really, 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 really get all the way down to fermenting um, because there's so much more 
wild yeast in there. They don't eat as fast, I guess. Yeah. The, the yeast so when you're using, so meat is when you're using honey, you're not using sugar, you're using honey. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had one explode on me. I was sitting in the kitchen and was what was that? <laughs> uh, um, and managed to get the rest and put them in the fridge um, before they also went. So that is like the only kind of scary part. You just want to make sure that you put them in a place where they can kind of stay contained. In four or five weeks, or in this case, for our event on November 5th, the day before, I'll throw these in the fridge and then I'll bust them out when it's time for us to have our cool event and people will get to try them. What it tastes like right now is not what it's going to taste like in five weeks. And it's not what it's going to taste like in 12 weeks. And it's not what it's going to taste like in a year, right? They're going to, it's going to continue to change. So if you open one and you're like, gross, hate it, you can wait on the rest, see if you like them later, or you can turn it into vinegar. Guess what? To turn it into vinegar, all you're going to do, introduce it to air. Voila. Because what's going to happen is all of those microbes are going to turn into acetic acid. So what happened is that we have, there's bacteria everywhere, right? There's a lot of bacteria in the air. One specific one that's in the air all the time is, I think is Acebaster, Acebacter. I, you know, I'm probably messing up the name, but that particular bacteria, once you open it up, like he did with one of them, is going to now enter the, the beer because it has an environment that it can be part of and it's gonna go in there and turn that alcohol into vinegar. So again, we are using bacteria, right? Yeast to just give us different types of product. We started with beer, then now you, if you don't want the beer, you can turn it into vinegar. So it's really, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna continue bottling all of these. Do you think, has it been five minutes for your wine oh yeah oh awesome okay cool now you guys so if you open up so you guys can see right here i just took this off and you guys you see that foam at the top they are up waking up waking up wakey wakey eggs and bakey yes so they are awake and what we're going to do now now that they're awake hi my name is journey hey. <laughs> Your seven billion children. <laughs> yes, exactly. Seven billion children. Um, but now what you want to do is you we're going to do pitching. And to pitch it is just to put this inside here, right? Really simple. Hmm. Now I'm thinking about it. Do you need to take a little bit of wine out? Yeah. See, I'm gonna take a little bit of this must out, right? But I'm, this isn't, like this I can drink, this I will not drink, okay? So I'm gonna put this right here and I'm just going to pitch, right? All you do is just add everything in. I'm gonna add it in, okay? I have room, so let me just... Yeah, maybe pour out a little bit of juice. Okay, so I'm just mixing. I just want to get all of the yeast, all of the bacteria. I don't want any of the bacteria to feel like they're not being loved. <laughs> Got to treat all your children. That's right. So equal. once you, so once you put the yeast inside, this is no longer a must, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry. All you got to do really is just a gentle fish. You don't even have to shake it. Now, this is a wine. This is officially now a wine. It's not ready to, for you to drink it, but it is now a wine. You put the, pitch, the, the yeast in. Don't do what I just did. Shake it like that. Just do a simple this, like this, and then that's it. Okay? So now you have a wine. Um, woo! And now you can even smell it. Smell it. You're not going to smell wine today. In about three days, you go back and you smell this. You're going to be like, oh my God, it smells just like wine. And then, so if you wanted to bottle that for long term, like I just did with my beer, mm -hmm. what would you do? So you will bottle it, right? So let's just say at the end of the 30 days, right? The end of the 30 days, this is going to be 
ready. Um, you know it's ready when you no longer are seeing the bubbles. Um, I don't know if the camera can actually catch it, but if you guys are looking here, you, you might see like little light bubbles um, coming up, right? So that is the bacteria activity that's happening, okay? So I can look at this and I'm seeing like, okay, the bacteria are in there, they're eating, everything is, is going good with the wine. Um, so in the 30 days, you no longer see any bubbles, it's flat, there is nothing happening, then you can go ahead and bottle it up. So you can go to your wine shop and see if they have any uh, wine bottles that are empty that they're not using. You can order some wine bottles that are unused, right? And really just put this inside of your wine bottle and you can also get fancy and do like, a, 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 oh my God, those, um, what you call that, Candice? Like a topper, like top no, it? No, not a topper. Um, oh, labels? A label, yes. You can make your own little label and get really fancy, right? And then just have it that way. Now, once you bottle it, right, you can set it to the side and let it age, right? You can bottle it and let it age, or you can start to drink it as soon as you want, right? I like to allow mine to age. That's why like when I make wine is with like, okay, you know, maybe for, you know, New Year celebration, right? Maybe for someone's birthday, maybe for a birth that's coming up, whatever it is. But the longer you let a wine sit, the better it gets always. Even if you taste it at the end of 30 days, you're like, oh my God, it's amazing, right? It will be even better <laughs> if you let it age. That's the whole thing with wine. Like aging is a thing. Like it comes with beauty. And how do you, ooh, aging is a thing. It comes with beauty. Absolutely. Uh, it beauty. How do you <laughs> see <laughs> your wine bottles? Give me a tattoo. How do you seal your wine bottles if you're using a... Um, like, you know, we're using old wine bottles or stuff like that. Well, if you're using old wine bottles, you might want to, like, I have a, a, a wine bottle topper type of thing that I use to, you know, because you get the cork. Yes. Oh, to put corks in. Yeah, I put the corks Especially in corks. and, it, you know, it will reinforce the cork in and then I can kind of like seal it with the top. Um, or sometimes I don't even do that. Sometimes... I don't have a cork, I have uh, a regular bottle and then I'll just close it with the top, you know? So it just depends on how fancy I want, it to, I want to be and how lazy I'm feeling at the time. So it could just be a regular top that I'm just using to seal it with or it'll be the cork and the whole wine um, top bottle. I sometimes if I'm using the screw tops, I'll like dip it in some wax or something just to try and keep a good air seal. Yeah. Because if you're not using something like a, a, a like a topper, right, yes. there is the chance that air can get in there yeah. and it will become vinegar, right? Which is why like when you go to a fancy restaurant and they like, I'm like, mm -hmm, and they like yeah. pour the wine for you, they're trying and to. The idea is supposed to be a, do you like the wine, but also is the wine so good, right? Yeah. It hasn't gotten oxygen in it. Yes. So you want to try and make sure that you kind of keep it really buffered against any oxygen. Absolutely. It. So for today, what we did is that, you know, we got everyone a stopper. Is my saying this right? Because yeah. I can, okay. Yeah. So you got stopper. everybody a stopper and you want to get a stopper number seven. It is really good because it fits into bottles, right? These types of bottles. A lot of bottles have similar length of size. So this is the topper and it fits. See, you put it in right here, it fits. And then you take this and you put it right on top, okay? So the reason why you wanna use this is so that again, you wanna make sure that the gas, right? That the yeast and bacteria are gonna be releasing can come out without you having to worry about your bottle exploding. So this is why I like this a lot because then I don't have to worry about explosion as much because I have an airlock, right? And now what I do with, what you wanna do with the airlock, you need to add in some water into your airlock. So you'll see that it has like maximum, right? 
right here. There's lines where it's like which is maximum. So you just want to add in some water inside of it. What I do in my house because well, I am in New York City. I, I do live in New York City building. So I actually, yeah, I actually like to put um, alcohol in mine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to put alcohol in mine. Like I'll just put a little bit of vodka and it's not a whole lot and put it in. This way, if anything, God forbid, will try to get into the wine, they won't make it that far because the alcohol will just destroy anything. It will kill any potential bacteria or anything like that. And the alcohol is not going to get into my wine. But even if it did, it's not going to do it's not going to do much. So this is it. So this is your wine. And now you just want to let it sit. So once it's ready like this, you want to put it in a dark. Okay, keep it in the dark. Everything grows in the dark. We grew in the dark. Okay, when we were in the womb, we were in the dark. Bacteria grows in the dark. When you're fermenting, dealing with anything of this sort, cool and dark place is the best way to go. So sometimes I will just take a bag, I will put it in. Like um, Candace mentioned earlier, how she puts hers in a box, right? In case of explosion, you can also use a garbage bag and put it in. So if something does happen, a spill, you know, happens, everything is caught inside and you don't have to do a whole lot of cleanup. But with the airlock, you don't really have to worry about all of that. And I love the way it looks. But yeah, mm. this is it. One thing to say is that temperature, the ambient temperature mm. around your yeast will impact how fast your ferment goes. Yes. If you ever look at like the farmer's almanac, when they say like the things to do in certain months, you'll notice they never say ferment beer in July and August. Why? Because it's hot. So like this beer that I did, it's been 80 some degrees. It fermented faster. Now, that's going to change the nature of the ferment. Sometimes it might make it more sour or more, you know, it might make it funkier or skunkier. I'm not too worried about it. It smells good. I'm going to taste a little sip of my wort just to see. But I'm, I feel pretty confident that I will have something drinkable. Um, but this is a great thing to be doing in the wintertime when it's cool. Um, because when things ferment slower, um, it can really kind of like change the way the flavors work. Absolutely. And it kind of makes sense too, because we're on harvest season right now in the fall. In the fall, you get everything, you know, fruits, roots, um, nuts, seeds, leaves, everything, right? And we tend to spend more time inside. So it just really does give you time to prep and do some things and not be so bored. Um, if you deal with a lot of boredom in the winter time or winter blues, just kind of give you some things to do and connect with. I also want to mention, like, you see how I have some must that are left? What you can do too, you can keep your must. So let's just say at the end of the 30 days, my wine is ready and I taste it and it's dry. I don't like dry wine. I want sweet wine. It's too dry. There's no sweetness whatsoever. You still have your must. You can add it back. You can, you can add it back into the wine um, to bring some of that uh, sweetness that you're after a little bit back. So you just put it in the fridge and hang on yeah, to it? Yeah, you just put it in the fridge and hang on to it and then for like 30 days and then you just Put it back in there if you need be. If you don't need it, then you just, I toss it because, you know, like I said, I, I have no need, no reason to do anything else with it. But the extra cup that you put to the side, you can also save it just in case if at the end you feel like it's too dry, right? Because the bacteria ate all of the sugar, then you can always kind of add something back or you can just drink it. It's totally up to you. Cool. So at this point, you've made a wart or a must, you've pitched it with yeast, you've put it in a bottle, then you've waited patiently for either four to five weeks in the case of an ale or a beer or a mead, or in the case of wine, nine months, two years, um, you know, until I have a child, which will be never. Uh, <laughs> so here, I've just popped open a beer that I made um, this past May. Um, Ooh. It is made out of, I have it written down, ah, a, a tip. Ladle. Ladle, what you mean. 
<laughs> don't no, think you're going to remember. Do not think you're going to remember. You're don't not say I have a great memory. Trust me. You won't. So the good news is I've started doing this thing where I label the, the beers I make on here so that then I can just go back and reference. So this one actually probably technically would probably fall under the like canon of a wine maybe um so it's as you can see i think it's dandelion flowers mm -hmm. um chamomile um and a little bit of orange and white sugar that i made in may um and i did pitch it i did only prime it because it's fizzy i heard the fizz when mm -hmm. you and um another thing to say is so um you know i have these growth bottles like this i really like them because like they're just kind of all in one are they reusable yeah oh yeah as are these but every time you bottle a new one you have to buy one of these dubers and some of these dubers and put them on top to seal it but yeah anyone want to try some I do, I do, I do. wine beer wine ale beer Another thing, look, I wanted, look, look, look. <laughs> uh, another thing I wanted to say is you, know, you have all this yeast, right, in the bottom of the, the bottle. Like you'll notice that I just uh, filled six bottles and I still have this much stuff in the bottom. And it's cloudy because as I was pouring, all the yeast um, kind of got churned up. That's okay. And honestly, I could probably make a seventh bottle um, and put all the yeast in the bottom. The yeast is not going to hurt you. In fact, the yeast could potentially be good for you. Um, and lots of, you know, people through time have drunk and, and considered the yeast a part of what they consumed. The reason you don't see this in conventional brews, please help yourself, Prost, um, is because it has been clarified out. Because if people started pouring out their cores light and then all of a sudden had a bunch of like white schnauzy stuff in the bottom, they'd be really sicked out. No, it's okay. It's fine. It's not going to hurt you. Um, and these, as they settle, are going to have some yeast in the bottoms of them. Too dark to see. What do you think? How is it? I love it. It's definitely, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, like tastes, it, tastes, it tastes like beer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But nothing floral. Yeah, it's yeah. floral. I love the fizz. It's light, it's fizzy. And then I have another one on the other end of the spectrum, so you can kind of see the difference between a white, using white sugar, and using brown sugar. Mm. Let me see. Where's another cup? Did you guys see that? Did you get that? Did you get that? Did you get that what? sweet action right here? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so this one is um, made with molasses and brown sugar instead. So you can see how much darker it is. And this one is wild carrot, sassafras, and hawthorn. And I made this in Ooh. December. So it's been aging for a while. I bottled it on Christmas Almost a year. Ooh. How does it feel to be uh, uh, uncorking these things after like a year? Oh, it's fun. And I, you know, it's one of the parts of doing this with people I really enjoy is like, um, and I'm going to have like four different kinds of beers for our banquet so that people can really kind of see like what the differences are. You know what I mean? I love mm. seeing the fuzziness. Like that's that's so cool. Here you go. Yeah, the foam is it's so yeah, like the dandy one. You can taste a little bit of the orange. It's like got a brightness to it. Yeah, for sure. It's wild carrot, sassafras, and hawthorn with brown sugar and molasses. The sugars really make a big oh, boy. Yeah, but I you can't taste the sugar. Right. And that's 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 the thing. That's one thing that I, you know, because I know a lot of people worried about sugar, but again, it's to feed the bacteria. Because when you're drinking it, mm -mm. Well, yeah, you can it has a nice little buzz to it too. Very present flavor in this one for sure. It has a nice little buzz to it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's been sitting for a while, so it's. And I will say, I um, you know, depending on how much sugar, like I said, right, for a beer, like one pound to one gallon, the more sugar you add, the more alcohol the yeast can produce, right? Because they will keep eating yeah. and keep making alcohol. Um, so if you're wanting to make something that's more 9%, 12%, like a wine or a like really, you know, alcoholic beer, add more sugar. If you want it to be much milder, Add just a pound, I, you know, and I um, don't go beneath the recommended beneath. because then you're not going to get what you're you're after. 
Yeah. Yeah. You want to do it at least a pound. But um, yeah, pretty cool. I so love it. I love it. Does anyone have any final questions or anything? Anything that we haven't talked about? Oh, we wanted to talk about health just a little bit. Yes. Um, but before we, we, still, we talk have about time health. to do that, let's see, what time is it? 3.55. We've oh. been talking a long time. Well, we can talk. We <laughs> 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 can talk. We can talk. Yeah, well, maybe we should just wrap up and we can talk about health yes. and all that stuff some other time. Uh, any kind of, like, final thoughts you want to? Um, oh. Why you have, like, a Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. So we both brought those two books. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's, let's it's, definitely because the other ones I can highlight. Yeah, next class. It's, it's, we see <laughs> great minds think alike. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Pascal, who I mentioned before, really great. If you wanted to kind of do um, like really kind of wild, if you want to start making your own wild yeasts, if you want to um, really kind of like be working with the like local ecosystem, I really recommend this book. It's also really lovely. And then um, Stephen Herod Buehner is an herbalist. Mm -hmm. um, and this book is really awesome for the like ethnobotany um, aspect of this. And he kind of, I actually was reading it this week. I bought it mostly for recipes and then was like, oh, I guess I could read the book too. <laughs> um, uh, like, um, yeah, he's got like some really nice, he goes through all the different herbs that people, particularly I would say in European cultures used, um, but he does talk about things like pulque and chicha and um, uh, something I don't know how to say, tea swim, um, different kind of African brews. So like he does a really nice kind of like global survey of some of the plants that are used and what their potential health effects would be. Yeah. Which kind of shows you that, again, like I said earlier, well, why we all use the same methods, we just call it different, right? And we may have different plants because we're in different region, but the method and the end result is always the same. So that's pretty cool. Um, oh, and then this one too, like wild wand making. I love this because I'm all about wild stuff and it just kind of gives you ideas on different type of wine that you can be making, right? So you have cherry, blueberry, and it can go down to something more spicy like, uh, uh, what is that called? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, like cayenne, you can Ooh, make wine flower. with cayenne peppers. like things like hot pepper wine, what? you know, who knew you can use <laughs> that, right? So it just kind of gives you all different things that you can do. That's why I like this one. I get a little bit of everything from fruits to herbs to things that grow in the wild. So I love, love, love this book. I do a lot of recipe from it. And then the other two books, you know, Candace already showed you guys. But thank you guys for coming and joining us, you know, in doing this. This has been really fun. Yeah. And now we get to finish I'm talking straight into this mic. Now we get to finish our beer. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, big shout out to the two of you for leading today's workshop. I want to let everyone who's uh, tuning in know that this is just one part of a four-part series. Um, our next part will be on more fermentation, more talking about lacto-fermentation and other ways to preserve our veggies, herbs, other good stuff. Um, that's happening on October 8th. And the series will continue throughout October with a culminating event on November 5th in person at the park. We will get to taste uh, this beer. Some of these other great treats we'll be uh, making throughout the series. So join us for our wild edible banquet on November 5th. And you can follow these two on social. Uh, Candace at the curb mm -hmm. and B Journey, yes. uh, Journey, <laughs> Journey Vimala <laughs> at B Journey. And we'll link those in our YouTube channel so you can uh, stay in the loop with what they're up to. Um, shout out to Stuyvesant Cove Park, our partner in this process, where, where Candace is coming from, our sister park down in the Lower East Side. Um, not Lower East Side, but the Lower <laughs> East Side. Um, and yeah, just keep following us for more uh, exciting, wild, edible food content. Um, thank you so much for joining today. And thank you, Tatiana, for leading all the tech behind yes. the scenes. <laughs>